All right, what's up, everybody? So today I'm going to be reviewing my very own lifting program. So a couple things to go over on this program itself. So a couple specifics. This is a hypertrophy focused, obviously push pull legs program. It is programmed six days a week since it is push pull legs that repeats twice. However, I do run it only five days a week. So the way I do this is let's say I start the program this coming Monday. I'll do that as day one and then finish up on day five. Week two, I'll start on day six and finish up on day four. Week three, I'll start on day five, finish up on day three, etc. So Every third week, there will be one of the either push, pull, or leg days that does get an extended two days of rest, which is totally fine. So technically, each muscle group is trained every three days for two weeks, and then every third week, it will be trained once every five days. So it's overall a moderate to low frequency program, but I think... Uh, that's one of the things that people tend to get a little bit too wrapped up about. One thing that I do want to talk about, mostly for the beginners here, is that when you're talking about programs and how you organize your training, the by far most important thing of programming is your exercise selection. Are you picking quality lifts and are you training them hard? Everything else is secondary to that. So if you have quality lifts and you're pushing them hard and they work well for you, things like frequency, volume, even rep ranges, while they all have their time and place and they're important, these things are all secondary. So I know a lot of people are going to focus on, oh, what rep ranges am I using? What volumes am I using for each lift? While that can be somewhat useful to kind of gauge where you should be at, at the same time, it's all individual and a lot of it does just come down to preference. I will touch on why I have specific volume amounts or why I have specific rep ranges for myself personally, and maybe it works for you, maybe it doesn't. But I think at the end of the day, the thing to focus on mostly here is the exercise selection and what lifts I use. That's why when I made my program reviews in the past, I don't even release the actual program. I just talk about what lifts I'm using because I think going over good lifts and showing you what lifts I actually use to get big is going to be the most important thing, much more important than something like a rep range or the volume amount that I use uh, actually is. Not that those aren't important, but those are always gonna be secondary to exercise selection, as I said. So uh, only one other little asterisk to go over here is it is a push-pull legs program. That doesn't necessarily specify where biceps and triceps go, so I did actually swap biceps and triceps. It'll be biceps on the push day, triceps on the pull day, it might ruffle some feathers, but at the same time, I get to train my arms fresh. And if my bicep training on my push day leads to poor performance on a pull day the following day, I'm just training my back movements wrong in the first place. It should have no issue whatsoever for most people if you have good technique. So let's start off with push days. So this will be day one and day four of the program. The first lift that we have here is a Smith bench. This is my bread and butter. This is a length and biased lift. So what you'll see is the rep range is going to be lower uh, in the hypertrophy side of things. So six to eight, five reps is about the lowest I'd go for any hypertrophy oriented lift or set. So six to eight is a pretty solid range here. I find that for length and biased lifts, when you're looking to get a decent stretch, going higher in rep ranges can actually be a little bit counterproductive because if you are going for a heavier stretch, the lighter weight isn't really going to help you out with that. When it comes to mechanical tension that you're trying to get from your proximity to failure, which drives growth, of course, you don't really need to go with light or heavy weight. It all kind of works the same as long as your proximity to failure is based on muscular failure. Uh, but when it comes to the, the weighted stretch, you do, of course, want to have heavier weights in mind because that actually does matter at that point. So uh, Smith bench is opening my first day. After that, you're going to see a 30 degree incline Smith bench. So what this does is it just complements the Smith bench. Very easy to set up because I'm in the same exact Smith machine. And now I get to target my upper chest just a little bit more. So the, the 30 degree incline Smith bread and butter lift for me. It feels super natural, very easy on my shoulders. Uh, and the upper chest is somewhat of a weak spot for me. So getting in some work on that is going to be super helpful. So for this first push day, that's all I've got for the chest work. Up next uh, in the sequence will be dealt. So what you'll see first is the Smith AD press in the six to 10 rep range. So 
Uh, there's nothing too special about this range. I just find that when I get over 10 reps, I start to get a little bit out of breath on overhead presses for some reason. I'm not entirely sure what it is, but I think on the on, on a lift with back support, it kind of crunches your neck in a little bit. It just makes it a little bit harder to breathe. So I go to, yeah, more of a moderate rep range here. Most of my work is in kind of the eight to 10. Very rarely do I go down to six. Eight to 10 would be a much more accurate representation of what I actually use there in practice. So up next, what you'll see after that is the cable side raise. This is just an insurance policy for the side delts. I think the side, de side delts get hit off right on the Smith 80 press. Uh, of course, this is going to be individual, and I think if you're someone that isn't sure if your side delts grow well or not from overhead pressing, it can't hurt to include some side raises. They're very easy to recover from. They're very easy to include in your program, so I say why not? I say go for it. So between this, the chest and shoulders have been hit very hard. Uh, it's all machine work with a little bit of cable work for the side raises, so it's all very stable pressing. It's all going to be lengthened to mid-range biased. Uh, and it's all, yeah, like I said, it's very stable. So you get to push hard, you get to push very, very close to failure. I usually aim for zero reps in reserve every now and then I'll fail a set, but I try not to do that because it's just, it, it's kind of failure is not what I'm actually going for. It's just the high effort, uh, reps towards the end of the set failures when you're kind of toast anyway so it doesn't actually do that much for you and beneath this of course we've got biceps too uh this is really nice to do towards the end of a push day because my biceps are fresh and i'm just ready to absolutely crush my preacher curls what you'll see on preacher curls is six to eight reps this is a heavier length and biased lifts uh lift since the biceps are being mostly trained in that bottom range on the preacher curl that means it is a length and bias lift, and I like to go a little bit heavier on those because that weight of stretch just feels so good. And who knows, there was a correlation between me doing preacher curls and me getting my arms up to 17 and a half. So we'll see. I'm going to keep pushing these. I did recently bump my volume up just a hair on here. So instead of two sets, which I've been doing for a long time, I'm actually up to three now. Uh, and that seemed to have pretty good correlation with my relatively quick increase in growth. So when needed, I think an extra set can really make a difference. I think that the, the thing here is understanding when you need the set. It will make a difference if you're plateaued in your lift and in your growth, then adding the set will be helpful. But if you're not plateaued and you're still growing, adding a set probably won't do anything for you. It might do a little bit, but who knows? More volume isn't always better. So it's one of those things where when you need it, it can be a total game changer, but you can't just take it when you don't actually need it and expect it to have the same result. So three sets on there. Those are excruciatingly hard. If you want big arms, you have to have to have to, have to treat something like a preacher curl the same way a power lifter would treat their squat bench deadlift. I made that mistake for years where I would just half-ass all my arm work and my arms i would wonder why they weren't growing very obvious now as i push as hard as i possibly can on my arm work and sure enough they've been growing like crazy so uh cable hammer curls after this just target the brachialis and the bicep just a tiny bit more so only two lifts for the biceps, only one lift truly directly to the biceps here with the close grip preacher curl. I just think it does such a nice job of training the biceps, the cable hammer curl, get the brachialis a little bit more. You'll notice it's only one set for the cable hammer curls, and that's because uh, the elbow flexors get pretty fatigued anyways from any curling variation. So the cable hammer curls are, I don't want to say they're a finisher because I think in the mainstream definition of finisher just sounds like fluff and pump work, and it absolutely is not. It's a very supportive, stable movement where I actually rest my elbow up on the cable post and I push these beyond failures. So usually I'm not even fresh enough to be able to do a second set. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll adapt and need that uh, down the road one day, but for now, one set is absolutely all I need there. And since my brachialis is like mostly fatigued from preacher curls, just one set can kind of finish the job on that. So overall, the day is very manageable. It's only six lifts total. So this usually doesn't take me too long, but the effort is just incredibly high. I push so hard. The, the exercise selection and how you lift your technique, this is what makes all the difference in the world. I push these all incredibly hard. They're basically all length and biased here in this day too, except for the cable hammer curls. Uh, and like I said, it's just technique and effort. And if you can keep getting better at those, you don't need a whole ton of volume. 
So the second push day, this one I won't spend as much time on because it's going to be very similar to the first one. So instead of Smith Bench, I do have a close grip Smith Bench. Uh, the volume is slightly lower because this is, this is a new lift for me that I just started recently. When I say close grip, I don't mean like tricep focused, like super narrow grip. This is just one and a half, maybe two inches in on my grip. So it's slightly, slightly narrower, mostly just to keep my shoulders fresh. I do find that if I keep the same pressing movements in for a long period of time, my AC joint does get a little bit of wear and tear on my right side. So this is just to keep my shoulder fresh. If I didn't have to do it, I wouldn't, but either way, it's a very good lift, very stable. And then after this, you'll see it's a 45 degree incline Smith press. So again, another incline variation, but instead of a 30 degree low incline, this is a moderate incline, very good for the upper chest and uh, probably not a whole ton for the rest of the chest and the lower pec. So that's why we see one set of dumbbell flies towards the end there and a lot of people do for some reason prefer to train their dumbbell flies in a higher rep range i think they think it's an isolation so it has to be fluff and pump high reps which doesn't make a whole ton of sense so uh basically with the dumbbell fly it's a length and biased incredible stretch lift where going heavier just feels a little bit better um and i i do like to go a little bit lower on the rep range there so i can go a little heavier get a little bit of a better uh, stretch there on the pec. So that helps make up any lost mid to low pec work from that incline press instead of uh, sticking to like a lower incline that can kind of maximize the growth of the entire pec. So beneath that, what you'll see is onto some delt work, Smith behind the neck press and dumbbell side raise. So for these, I don't even have rep ranges set quite yet. And I don't have weights picked out yet because these are brand new. Uh, I haven't done these in a very long time. Dumbbell side raises I haven't done consistently since before I even had the home gym. Dumbbells are a nightmare <laughs> to adjust in home gyms, but I figured I can make it happen for these. Uh, and then Smith behind the neck press. I haven't done this in a really long time, probably since I first got my Smith machine nearly a year ago. And even then, I didn't stick with it very consistently. So I'm still trying to find a rep range that works well. Usually 8 to 12 is a really good default for hypertrophy. Uh, I know it kind of gets memed sometimes, but 8 to 12 is a, it's, it's a safe play and it's moderate. And you can try going a little lighter, try going a little heavier and see what feels better from there. So that's likely what I'll do. We shall see. So that should hit the shoulders pretty well. The behind the neck press for myself personally does really work the side delts. Part of it could be sensation, but I have seen good correlation when I've done this consistently with side delt growth. So we shall see how that goes. It's been a while. Beneath this, what you'll see, something uh, relatively boring for the biceps after this. So close grip preacher curls and cable hammer curls. The same lift in the same rep range with the same weights with the same volume and i'm doing that again and yes that's super boring and that program that programming approach won't appeal to many people but i am not prone to arm overuse or arm injuries whatsoever so if a lift is working for me i'll i'll quote unquote i'll spam it so that's a lot of work uh, on the same couple movements, but it works well and my arms are growing the best they ever have and I'm on year seven of lifting. So why fix what isn't broken? Of course, it wouldn't be the dumbest idea in the world to just make it a slightly different variation to prevent any potential overuse, but I've been doing this for a really long time and I've been perfectly fine. Uh, and I am pushing myself hard. I have pretty big arms now and I am getting pretty strong. Uh, kind of, not really, but kind of for myself at least, uh, and it's worked fine. So that is it for the pull days. I mean, for the push days, let's move on to the pull days. I'm getting ahead of myself. So to do a quick recap on the push days, overall, they are heavily chest, shoulder, and bicep focused. Obviously, those are the only three muscles that I'm training very directly. It's a decent amount of upper chest work, no real low chest work in specific. I'm not doing dips or anything like that or decline pressing. So the lower chest might suffer just a tad, but I do have a decent amount of flat pressing. So that shouldn't be too much of a concern. Uh, overall, a little bit of side delt isolation, not a whole ton, but for myself where shoulders are a strong point, I can get away with doing a little bit less of that. Uh, no direct rear delt work and not a whole ton of variation for the biceps, but I am using lifts that work really well for me. So uh, moving on to the pull days, the, the one thing I do want to start off with is I don't actually have any direct rear delt work. I know on a push day, some people do include that. And if you're expecting to see 
di uh, direct rear delt work on my pull days, you actually won't see it. And the reason for that is because I just haven't really found a lift for the rear delts that I actually like uh, enough to put in my program aside from reverse pec deck. I'm not saying it's not worth doing, but for myself, for my delts are, are already a strong point. I'm just going to wait until I either have a reverse pec deck I can use here or until maybe I do my pull days at the commercial gym instead of the home gym. And I can just use the reverse pec deck there and use that as a period to uh, in increase the size of my rear delts at that point. But for now, I'm okay with keeping them on maintenance. The delts can maintain pretty well just through pushing and pulling. They won't grow optimally, that's for sure. But if any muscle contain can maintain nicely through other movements, the delts do a pretty good job of that. And then Barbell Apparel is having their Black Friday Cyber Monday deal, 99 bucks for any pants, jeans, or chinos, if that's not good enough. Their entire website is up to 50% off everything. So if you've been liking anything I've been wearing in my videos, especially those ultra light tech tees that I wear basically every time I lift now, I would highly recommend going to check them out. I'll put my personal collection in the description of this video. You can also just check out everything else on their website too. It's great stuff. It actually form fits to your physique. So no more buying like a medium shirt that doesn't really fit your arms and is huge around your gut or same with a large one it's just super long and huge around the gut they actually fit your physique they fit nice around the traps delts arms etc and around your legs with the pants they actually fit your quads and glutes so they're designed for lifters they fit super nicely and they just make you feel better during your workouts and if you have any clothes that you wear outside of the gym same thing for that, you actually get to show off the physique that you've worked so hard to build as a bodybuilder. It is incredible to finally find a company that actually makes clothes that fit people with good muscular physiques. So if you've been grinding it out in the gym, like I have, trying to get a bodybuilder type physique, let these clothes complement your physique and show off the hard work you've put in. Pull day one, day two of the week, you're gonna start off with Penlay Rose, six to 10 reps, and I'm doing two sets on these. These are a pretty new lift for me. It's basically just a good way to get a moderately cheated row that I can really use to target the traps. Very strict rows aren't the best for targeting the traps, depending on the resistance profile of what you're using. Uh, it's just very difficult to get a full contraction and actually have it be stimulative in the rest of the range of motion because the strength curve of rows is so whack that using cheat methods or nicer machines that have good resistance profiles is always going to be the way to go for penley rows or not for penley rows for rows in general so things like power shrugs uh certain machine rows cheat rows these are all going to be the way to grow the traps optimally in my opinion so penley rows to start off with the emphasis on the mid to lower traps a little bit of upper traps but i am relatively bent over there uh, back is pretty close to parallel with the ground so after that, I am moving directly into the lats. The first lift I've got is the single single arm hammer strength pull down, two sets in the six to 10 range there. The key with this is neutral grip and lean slightly into the side that I'm training. So with this, I get a little bit of a stretch on the lat around my rib cage, really good feel and my lats have grown nicely from including this. Uh, up next, the semi-supinated row. So this is a row of vertical, not a vertical, a horizontal pull now that I've already done a vertical pull for the lats. So basically the entire lat, mostly the lower lat, is targeted through the pull down in the vertical plane. Uh, and then when I'm doing a horizontal row with a lat bias, of course, with that narrower, slightly underhand grip, I get to target the upper lat a little bit more uh, because it is a horizontal pull. So that's really nice movement, really been liking those. And I do use a little bit of cheat reps past failure there because it is a strict row. And I'm just not a massive fan of very strict rowing for the back. So up next after this, dumbbell pullovers. This is a very new lift for me. Uh, seven to 12 rep range, I figured should be fine for now. I don't see myself going as low as seven. Uh, the rep ranges, keep in mind, they are somewhat loose. I don't stick to these very precisely. I don't even really track reps that seriously on a lot of lifts too. Most lifts I do, but for lifts that are either short and biased, like a lot of back training, uh, or lifts where I just go way beyond failure anyways, sometimes I find that it's not even worth tracking. So Dumbbell pullovers, this is a slow and controlled movement to get a crazy stretch on the lats, train them in the length and position, which is always fun. Uh, it's just an enjoyable movement all around, aside from setting the Olympic dumbbell up, because 
they are very painful. Lots of moving parts on those dumbbells. This is what makes me miss a commercial gym in some ways. So back is trained pretty thoroughly at this point in the day. Up next, what you'll see is some tricep training. So Smith Jam Press is the starting lift here. This is a super deep stretched lift. Incredible for the medial and lateral head of the triceps. I feel nothing in the long head of the triceps, and I haven't seen any long head growth from including these. I'm still very bicep dominant in my arms, but the lateral head of my triceps, which is always a weak spot, uh, is starting to blow up from this. Even just from feeling and looking at my arm, it's very noticeable. It's not like this weird little advanced lift or growth where I'm like, oh, well, technically my arms are up eighth of an inch. No, it's like very noticeable growth that I can see extremely clearly, which is super cool. And that's why I am so obsessed with them. So two sets of them on here, easy bar over at overhead extensions after this, uh, just one set on here since I have the pullovers. And for now, my the long head of my triceps will be brutally sore just from doing those because I haven't done direct long head work in a very long time. Uh, and then after this, I have two sets of incline pushdowns, more work basically for the entire tricep, a little bit of the long head, but not as much of a stretch. And then I do get to train the lateral head and the medial, medial head too, of course. Uh, you don't have to worry too, too much about the tricep head biasing in your lifting in your exercise selection, but I think it's worth somewhat paying attention to, especially for the long head. So uh, if that workout sounds familiar, that is because it was my last video. I posted that entire session up as like a pull day training vlog. So the second pull day, day five of the week, the starting lift is the single arm dumbbell row mechanical drop set. So with this, it is a strict set of rows to failure. Single arm dumbbell is what the SADB means. So I'll do a set of strict reps to failure. Then I'll do a handful more cheat reps to failure with that level of cheat, which is usually another four to six reps. And then the third set, I know it's starting to get a little bit crazy. I'll actually do Penley style, uh, Penley style reps. And with these, I'll just go into more of a split stance, drop the dumbbell on the floor between reps for about a second, and then use a little bit of cheat to drive the dumbbell up and get it up high and then control the eccentric. This is usually another three to five reps after that. So overall, it does end up being usually about 20 reps, give or take throughout the whole set. Uh, this is one of those things where tracking your reps kind of matters, kind of doesn't because there's a decent amount of cheat. The range of motion is so weird. It's Sometimes if you're someone that's prone to progressive overload anxiety, it might not even really be worth tracking your reps. Just add weight once you feel like you can add a little bit more weight. After this, single arm hammer strength pull down yet again, same as the last pull day. This is just my bread and butter lat lift, and I spent a bunch of money on this machine too, so I better be putting it to good use. Lat pull downs after that. These are overhand lat pull downs, somewhat strict with, of course, a little bit of cheat just to even out the resistance profile and get a full contraction here. So this is a good lift for the lats and for the traps. So this kind of makes sure everything is hit. Lat pull downs just outside shoulder with the grip, a little bit of cheat, and then the semi supinated row yet again, just to finish off the lats. This is a great movement that I've really been loving. After this, it's actually the same three lists for the triceps yet again. Keep in mind that my recent big spurt and arm growth, I wasn't doing this much variety or this much volume. This is just an experiment to see how it goes. I have no idea if I will see more growth, if I will see less growth, that's why it's an experiment. So keep in mind, it was mostly close grip preacher curls and then Smith JM press with a little bit of incline pushdowns and a little bit of cable hammer curls before that got me all that arm growth. The easy bar over to overhead extensions were not included. So this is more volume and more variety than I used to get to 17.5 from 16 and three quarters or so. So that's it for the pull days. Let's move on to the leg days. All right, so on to the fun part. So the leg days, days three and six. So what I start off with is a hack squat in the five to eight rep range. So I find that when I go a much above eight reps, my breath does start to become somewhat of an issue, at least with very controlled eccentrics. The set time and the set duration just goes on so long to the point where yeah, I'm probably not letting my breath become a limiting factor entirely, but why take the risk when I can just go into a slightly lower rep range? And it's a length and bias movement anyways, so the heavier weight could potentially help with a little bit of a weighted stretch benefit, which the quads may benefit from too. So 
uh, two sets in the five to eight range there, and then two sets of six to eight of the pendulum squat, the arsenal pendulum squat. This thing is legit. Uh, my quads are completely smoked after this, more than they ever were when I was powerlifting. It's not even close. It's absolutely insane. And these are two lifts where if you need much more than this, like for myself personally, if I needed more than this, I would probably just really have to audit myself because I'm probably not pushing hard enough on these two lifts. I pushed a zero RIR and every now and then failure by accident on these two lifts, and I am absolutely smoked. If you're resting like less than two or three minutes between your sets, you're probably not training hard enough. I need usually at least five minutes rest. I would say five to 10 minutes between each one of these sets uh, to truly fully recover. And even then, like I'm still gassed by my second set. These four sets are brutal. <laughs> It's a true test of commitment, and I absolutely love it. And they grow my quads so nicely as a reward, and I can't say enough good things about these lifts. I actually do these in both of my leg days, and I've been doing this for quite a while. So hack squats and pendulum squats, incredible builders for the quads, and my quads are toast after that. So after the quads, hamstrings are up next. You'll notice that I only have seated ham curls and uh, both leg days are actually the same, so I'm just going to put up one leg day so you don't have to look at both for no reason. Seated ham curls, no hip hinges, and the reason for that is because once I'm done with my hack squats and pendulum squats, I'm I'm just entirely gassed. Like, I could try to do RDLs and everything, but I one, I feel like I wouldn't be consistent with it because of how exhausted I would be, and two, something like a seated ham curl can do probably equally as good of a job at training my hamstrings. Yeah, I'm losing out on some benefits for the glutes and for the spinal erectors, but those are lower priority muscles for me now since they were such a high priority during my power building days for so long. So I can, I can afford to skip RDLs for now and stick with seated ham curls. And then when I add RDLs in, my hams will be grown and I'll have more time and energy to grow my posterior chain so uh, obviously with that power building emphasis my quads were kind of put on the back burner so that's why i can put most of my emphasis on quads to kind of get everything evened out and from there maybe it will look a little bit more consistent down the road so after that we've got the calf raises so with calves i'm actually doing four sets per session now which is pretty high especially considering they're a very weak muscle group. They're arguably my weakest muscle group, uh, size-wise right up there with quads. So uh, that's why quads and calves are getting all the focus here versus hamstrings, glutes on my leg days. So standing calf raise, this is two sets on here. This is just the standing machine. You can also do the Smith machine. These are both very good lifts for the calves. The only slight downside to these is you have to really focus on keeping your abs and your butt tight so your hips don't shift around. Since the weight is loaded on your shoulders and your calves are basically at the bottom of your entire physique, there is a lot of areas in your body where tension can leak, so you have to really brace hard, keep your grip tight, keep your abs crunched, keep your butt tight, keep your knees locked. There's just a decent amount of areas where tension can leak, so form is very important here. A lot of people just don't pay attention to their form or their effort levels or execution of their calf training, and that's why everybody has small calves. So standing calf raises, while they do require more of an emphasis on your technique and your bracing and your form, uh, they're still a fine lift and they still will grow your calves very well. So after this, just as somewhat of an insurance policy, but more so just a variation to continue my volume, a leg press calf raise. So what I like to do on these is take the linear hack squat, which is like a seated inverted leg press where the weight is by your hips and you're pushing yourself up on the sled itself. With these, one of the benefits to it is it keeps your hips in a fixed and locked position. So the only potential area where tension could leak is through your knees. And as long as you keep your quads tight and keep your knees locked, you can push these very hard. I find that on these, if I go into a full lockout where I fully contract my calf, my feet start to slip on the pad. So I mostly do these as bottom half partial reps. I'll go from the deepest stretch I can all the way up to about about parallel so to where my feet are basically flat maybe a hair above but i do find that just the natural strength curve of the calves themselves they're so weak in the contracted in the fully contracted position that 
it's probably not even worth training that top 10% of the lift because you have to use a weight that's so light that the other 90% of the lift of the range of motion uh, that's normally more stimulative is now not stimulative because you had to reduce the weight just to make it so you could get that arbitrary lockout. So I'd rather take the bottom 50 to 75% of the range of motion, maximize my stretch and maximize my tension on that and push those all the way as hard as I possibly can. And when I do calf raises, I do as many full reps as I possibly can. When I hit failure, I tap into a mindset that says, I'm gonna push this pad away from me, the, or the calf block, whatever it is, as hard as I possibly can away from me. And when I put that cue into my mind, I can usually do multiple more reps. So I'll do multiple more reps like that, and then when that cue no longer works and I'm truly at failure, I'll do bottom half partial reps, if not smaller reps. And then I'll even do just a weighted stretch hold for about three to five seconds once I truly hit failure. And then I'll step down and try to find somewhere to sit because I definitely can't walk and will probably fall over. So with all that said, that's my entire program for now, guys. So that's all I've got for today. If you guys have any questions or anything, definitely let me know in the comments. I'd be very curious to hear everybody's thoughts and feedback. And uh, yeah. That's pretty much it. So like I said, any questions, let me know. I'll see you guys in the next one.